What is up everyone? TC here with Smoky Mountain Knifeworks, smkw.com, and today we're here at the Greenbrier restaurant in Gatlinburg with corporate executive chef Aaron Ward. We're gonna be going over some of our kitchen knives, their general purpose and use, and some tips and tricks that you can use at home. My name is Chef Aaron Ward. I'm the corporate executive chef for KBS Restaurant Group, and I am the executive chef of Greenbrier Restaurant, which is a a food and spirits outposts here in uh, Smoky Mountains, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We're sort of off the beaten path. I've been in this area doing the chef thing for about 30 years. Um, I actually started washing dishes when I was 11. Um, probably don't want to tell the Department of Human Services that, but that's so long ago, that was so ancient ago, 1982, I believe, standing on a milk crate, actually. So I kind of fell in love with everything going on on the other side of the line, all the flames, the sharp knives, you know, the, the whole pirate culture. So 30 some odd years later, here I am, still at it. What I would like to talk to, uh, about today is knives. We're here with Smoky Mountain Knife Works, so knives are on the agenda. Um, for you cooks at home, you're, you're aspiring chefs, the knife is, I mean, it is your tool. It's an extension of you. It's extension of your work ethic. That's really what I watch. I, you know, sharp knives stay quiet. That's a motto we have here in this kitchen and uh, really it's the upkeep, the maintenance, and it's, it's a daily task. Um, now I know at home, you know, you're not breaking down 50 pounds of this and 50 pounds of that, you know, you're doing one meal at a time, but it still holds true in your home. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk through what, we, what we're gonna um, show today. And I have three different selections. Actually, we have four different selections of primarily, primarily the same knife. This is a, eight inch chef's knife or a utility knife. This is, if you're gonna go into a kitchen with only one knife um, or be dropped off in the bush with only one knife, this would be my choice, okay? It's utility, it's, uh, you can do a lot of different things with it. I can basically, everything that I'm going to do today and show different knives and each one of their ability and distinct purposes, I still believe this is the most important knife that you're gonna to see today. It's a chef's knife. 8 inch, I think that's the perfect size, 10 inch, a little big. This is my personal knife that I use on a daily basis. So 10 inch, basically we have the same knife in an 8 inch. More manageable, um, you won't get as much fatigue using a smaller blade and it has just as many purposes as the 10 inch. So it's, it really comes down to personal preference. Same thing with the shape and the ergonomics, did I pronounce that right? Ergonomics of the handle. Um, really depends on the size of your hand, the shape of your hand, the strength of your hand, how long you're going to be using the knife. So that, that's really important to make sure. And, and when you go to Smoky Mountain Knife Works to, to pick up one of these fine blades, make, make sure that you test drive it. You handle it. Just like driving a car. Make sure it fits your hand. Make sure it feels good. Make sure it's balanced well in your hand. This is a Wustoff, very fine knife. We have a Victrinox, another fine knife. And this is, this is Quite a bit lighter than the Wustoff. A lot, lot has to do with the handle. Okay, so that's the Victrinox. Here we have a Shun. That's a nice handle. And then this is more like a, a Japanese style utility knife. Very beautiful blade. Like I said, the, the main thing for the maintenance of these and the ease of use and to not cut your finger off is to keep that knife sharp. Okay, this is a steel. This does not sharpen your knife. This will not put a blade on your knife. I would leave that to the professionals. Do what I do, take it to Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Let them sharpen it. This is mainly just a maintenance tool for you to use at home. And what this does, you'll get microscopic little nicks and cuts and, and, and frays along your blade that you won't be able to see, but you'll definitely be able to feel. So if I'm breaking down a salmon or I'm breaking down a tenderloin, a lot of times it will actually tear through that meat instead of slicing through it, okay? so. Real important, you keep, this is a thumb guard, you keep your thumb behind that as you're doing this. And practice keeping this on a 15 degree angle and just running that down the steel. And try to keep your blade in the top half. Don't bring it all the way down because that's when you realize, I've seen guys just slice their thumb wide open. You know, they get, they want to do this, you know, they want to be cool and all that. Take your time, learn the 15 degree angle, learn how to drag that down with your wrist, not your whole arm. You don't want to bring this blade all the way down the steel. 
Okay, keep this hand out of harm's way. So basically, we're just maintaining the knife. We're getting this knife ready to work. Another knife that we're going to showcase is another Shun, and this is more like a Japanese vegetable cleaver, high-sided, so you can really get in and do that, that vegetable work. Um, go over some of that, some of that technique a little bit later on. And then we're going to showcase. This is absolutely beautiful. KAI Pro, this is a slicer. We're going to be slicing some prime rib with this. And you can see how this blade, it actually digresses as it, goes, as it gets closer to the blade. And that's to give you a, very, a thin knife is for slicing because you really, you really want to make that precise. The thinner the knife, almost like a razor blade at the end, that gives you a good starting point and a good ending point. And then the knife basically just does all the work for you with the right applied pressure and we'll go over some of that. All right, we've already talked about some basic daily maintenance, pre-use maintenance of your knife. Now let's talk about sort of some uh, knife skills. Um, this is something you can all work on at home. It will greatly improve your efficiency, um, make it a little bit safer for you. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna fab using the Shun 8 inch chef's knife with the beautiful handle. Um, we're going to fab up a mirepoix. Mirepoix is basically the, the trinity or the medley. Um, it's the base to most of your soups, stocks, roasts. Uh, so that's basically celery, carrots, and onion. I'll show you how to break this down. Most important part, keeping your left hand and your right hand connected. Your left hand connected to the blade. Don't do what I'm about to do. Practice, practice slowly. Um, but basically what I'm doing is I am using my index finger on my left hand. If you're left-handed, it'll be your right hand. Uh, but basically I am using that as a guide. If you guys can see this, I get my thumb, that's the piggy you don't want to get in the way. That's the most injury I see. Um, actually, I've done it a couple of times myself. I got some scar tissue. Uh, but keeping your thumb out of the way, it's almost this with your index finger protruded, and that is basically your guide, okay? So we're gonna take the celery. That's beautiful. I like the taper of the blade. I like how at the very end, I mean, it really gets, really gets thin. And that's what you want cutting through this. Same thing with the carrots. So the blade never comes above the knuckle of my index finger. In the restaurant, here in the restaurant, it's all about speed, accuracy, and safety. Um, at home, it's gonna be more of impressing your dinner guests, uh, becoming confident with a knife. Uh, and your knife skills. So this is something to practice. And you can practice on a cutting board. And you see I have different colored cutting boards. So green is for vegetables, blue is for fish, red is for meat. Um, so there's no cross contamination. Always keep um, little, you know, some sandy water, a little bleach water with a towel so you can clean your blade off as you're going from um, vegetable to different proteins. And this is something, like I said, that you can practice. This is the best knife to practice with because it is broad. It has a broad blade. Another great knife to do this with, a little bit different style. This is a Shun as well. Another nice handle, looks like it's walnut. Full tine going all the way through. This is a great knife. This is really made for this, for vegetable breakdown. It's a Japanese vegetable cleaver. And that just gives you a lot, a lot of surface to work with. But like I said, you know, the way to, to really be proficient at this is be deliberate with your motions until your left hand and your right hand sort of, they, they're kind of married to each other. Each hand knows what the other hand is doing, where your knife is going. All right, let's talk about shallots. Okay, this is, uh, you don't see a lot of home cooks cooking with shallots, but it's the basis of so many different cuisines, so many sh um, different recipes. It's actually in the garlic family, so it's a, it's a little bit of hybrid between an onion and a garlic, so it still has some heat to it. Let me just give you a, a quick pro tip on 
onions, root vegetables, anything with a root ball end, when you're fabbing this up, leave that intact. Don't ever cut that off. I see a lot of people, they'll go ahead and square off each side and then they're left with all the layers. And so they're trying to bunch up the layers. So I'm just gonna show you real quick on it. Let's do a Spanish onion. So I have the root ball end. I'm gonna leave that intact. What that does, holds it together, okay? So if I had cut that off, once I start fabbing it, okay, it's gonna release the gases, it's gonna, all the fluid's gonna start coming out, it's gonna get slime, sort of slimy, start going all over the place. This way, and it's another safety issue, holds it all in place while I'm fabbing it, so. Same thing with the shallot. Again, leave the root ball. Holds it all together. All right, now another good use for a cleaver style, a couple of different styles, um, mincing garlic and also crushing garlic. We do steak tartare up here to order and we do this every time uh, steak tartare goes out, we make garlic paste, basically on the fly. Real simple, show you all how to do that. And the benefit of this broad blade on this shoon cleaver. Um, but so we have some peeled garlic cloves. I'm gonna put some kosher salt down. Basically all this is is for traction. And basically you're gonna crush it. That's where this blade really, really comes in handy trying to do that with say a boning knife you really just don't have the coverage you don't have the leverage it can be done like I said um, my go-to knife I would do it also with a 10 inch chef's knife 8 inch chef's knife let's try this uh, Wustoff this has got really good balance it's heavy enough but balanced enough and I think light enough for you know prolonged knife works knife work Freudian slip beautiful and we'll use that in something we're going to make for you guys a little later on all right, going back to the 10-inch uh, the chef's knife, again, doing close hand-to-hand -hand work, this would be my number one choice, 8-inch or a 10-inch chef's knife, whatever you feel comfortable with. And what I mean by you know doing real, it's almost hand-to-hand -hand combat, what you're doing. We're gonna chiffon on some parsley that's gonna go in the steak au pois that we're gonna do a little bit later on. And basically I've got, I've just torn the leaves off of flat leaf parsley. I kind of put those into a ball and this is a really, really fine, fine, fine dice. Really has nothing to do with the flavor, has nothing to do with how it interacts with the dish. It's just when it goes to the table, um, you know, the knowing eye can look at that and say, okay, this was prepared, prepared by a professional. Um, just, you know, the, the cut accuracy really means a lot up here at Greenbrier and within our culinary culture. So that's some chiffonade herbs, like I said, Real hand-to-hand, -hand, close, close work, keeping your left hand and your right hand communicating with each other. And that's, where, that's where you come to get the speed, and that's where you can talk to your dinner guests, you know, as you're showing off. They're going to love it. Now we're going to move on to a little bit different style of knife. Uh, we have got, this is a shoon, again. This is a six-inch blade, another nice walnut handle, full tine. And this is a boning knife. Boning knife is generally, it has a, a lot more flex to it and there are degrees of flex. Um, this one I would think is a very heavy flex. So it's a little more rigid than your typical boning knife, but that, that's a good thing. And I'm gonna really show you where this comes into play. Your husband just brought back a big trout from his fishing trip. He doesn't know what to do with it. Well, you're gonna impress him. 
couple of different ways that you can. This is a round fish. I also have a flat fish, a flounder, that I'm going to show you the technique. There's a couple of different ways that you can stake this out. You can start at the dorsal fin and follow that fin line, take it all the way back, cutting through all the pin bones, and then turning that over and taking tweezers, bone tweezers, and actually going through there and pulling those out. Or you can use the boning knife as it was intended to. So basically, when you have the, the skeletal structure of this fish, you're going to go in and be able to feel the bone with your knife. You'll be able to feel the contour of the rib cage. And basically, that's why the knife flexes, so that it can flex and undulate with the natural curvature of the skeletal system of whatever you're fabbing. So basically, I'm going to score this right at the very top. I haven't hit a bone yet, so I'm not that deep into it, okay? But the trick is finding the bone. There we go. It's pretty, huh? This knife is very sharp and it needs to be a stuff like this. This flesh, you don't want to tear it, okay, for plate presentation. So really nice, sharp knife, keep it sharp. The thinner the blade, the better. Um, as far as the flexibility, it really depends on your preference as far as your skill level goes. Oh, I got a couple of bones in it, a little bit rusty. But take your time, really, you know, use the knife for what it's used for, for what it's made for. Um, another good thing you see that this belly skin, that's another good thing a flexible sharp knife is good for to get under that and take that out with this bone structure, this rib bones right here, call them pin bones. Um, for example, this knife, it's it's not nearly as flexible and you're going to take, it won't follow the contour of it. So you'll actually cut into the flesh. And in this business, that is profit. Uh, it's all about yield. You know, what, what can you yield out of this salmon? Um, so that's where this comes into play because you can actually lift up on it, lift up on the knife and follow it through. Get those bones out of there. So in my world, we haven't really lost any profit there, taking those bones out. So that's really good for, the, for a boning knife. I'm going to show you another thing with a boning knife real quick. Let me get it cleaned up, move this out of the way, and I'll be right back. All right, there again, I'm just uh, knocking, you know, I hit a couple of bones in there, and you'll be surprised because when you get down, a sharp knife, a very sharp knife is going to have a very thin lower edge that's what you want okay um, we're not chopping wood with these things so you want to keep that thin and you put this under a microscope even after a, a just a few uses you know just on that salmon you're going to pick up just little not nicks so much um, but some burrs and imperfections and really that's like I said again that's what this does basically this just hones it back down to that either the factory blade or that nice blade that the fine craftsman at Smoky Mountain Knife Works put it on for you. All right, we have another another example of a fish, and of course up here at Greenbrier you see everything's fresh. We have it flown in three times a week. This is flounder or fluke. We do a crab stuffed flounder dish up here. This is actually a pretty cool fish. Um, you can see that the eyeballs are on one side. This is a bottom dweller, actually. But when they're born, when they're first born, they're right they're, they're right up, and they actually swim right side up. As they mature, they turn and their eyeballs actually migrate to the top side of the fish. But anyway, you're going to get four fillets out of this. All right, so we're going to break this down and basically you're going to come on top of the pectoral fin and you're going to score this right down the center. And basically, if I turn this flounder over, you're going to kind of see what I'm following. See this line right there? 
that's sort of what I'm following from that pectoral fin. This is another fish that you really want to get in there. You, you want to get in and find that bone, find your skeletal structure. And with the flexibility of, of this knife, you're going to be able to actually push down and follow that bone line, that rib cage of the fish without actually getting into the bones. And then this fillet will be a totally boneless fillet ready to fire up. You can see that, how you can see the bones, how this knife lays right on top of the bones, kind of flexes as you go. Breaking fish down, breaking seafood down, it can be intimidating until you do it. Um, I would suggest before you start trying to do anything, make sure you have the right knife and make sure that that right knife is as sharp as humanly possible. All right. Beautiful fat flounder today. Then we're gonna take the skin off of it. I'm gonna clean this up just a little bit. Taking the skin off, it's the same process, the same practice as following the bone structure. Basically, you're gonna lay this knife right on top and basically just push it through. All right, so that's the characteristics and the uh, different uses for a boning knife. Um, primarily, boning knife used for fish or taking any type of meat off the bone. Um, so play around with that. I would suggest until you become proficient at it um, that you get a knife with a little more flex in it than this. Um, just to give you a little bit more practice with following that that structure of the bone line All right, now we're going to move on to some tenderloin beef tenderloin the beef tenderloin it comes it's Sort of like the, the lower the upper hamstrings of the cattle um, It sits right on the back muscle. It doesn't move a lot It has no connective tissue or marbling inside of it because it doesn't move a lot. It is super tender fork tender super tender it doesn't have a lot of depth of flavor. It's not very mature in flavor. Okay, so it's more of mouthfeel. Um, you have a lot of people that like the filet just because it is so tender. Um, so breaking this down real quick, and I'll show you why it is so important to use this knife. Um, so we have some of this white fat cap on that. We're gonna scrape that off. See that? That goes in the garbage. I'm going to turn this over and this is where the tenderloin connects to the vertebrae and we're going to take this off and that's why it's very important to have a, a slender knife very sharp so when you're cutting through this like I said you're not dragging away profit uh, so basically you're just going to find that that natural line I'm going to take that off Okay, and the structure of a tenderloin, this is the tail, the barrel. If you say, you know, on the menu, it said barrel cut beef tenderloin, filet of beef, beef, um, sorry, filet mignon. Um, when it says barrel, it comes out of the barrel. Um, and this is the head or the Chateau Brion. All right, so the main purpose of this knife for this exercise, for this piece of beef, is taking the connective tissue or the, what we call in the industry the silver skin. Um, it's not edible. Um, it will not break down. It won't melt and go away in your broiler. It will not add flavor as it melts and goes through the protein. Uh, this basically has to come off without losing your profit. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this knife and we're going to poke it under there, okay, and take and then turn the knife basically upside down and come across that so that I'm not picking up any beef off of that, okay? And then by applying a pressure and making that taunt and taking the knife 
and I'm not really, I'm not guiding the knife. I'm getting the angle right, which is 15 to 20 degrees, and I'm just pulling that knife to me. Okay. Now, can you do it with a vegetable cleaver? I can. It's not optimal. You can see a little bit more on that just because of the diameter, the thickness of the blade. It's not as flexible. I don't feel it as well. Okay. It's more, this is more like a brute, you know, get it done kind of knife. This is more finesse feel. Take that off. Chateau, we'll grind that later. It's really important that you take all this off, even the stuff that you can't see that's hidden underneath the muscle. And then we're going to cut this in. Here's a, let's see, let's go to another knife. Let's, uh, KI Pro, slicing knife. Um, not a bread slicer. Uh, this is mainly a, a meat slicer, prime rib, turkey carver. Uh, I'd say you'd be the envy of the Thanksgiving table if you whip this sucker out. That's, that's a beautiful knife. Well made, well balanced. Beautiful little petite fillets that I'm going to make a steak au poire for you guys at Smoky Mountain Knife Works a little bit later on. All right, let's move on to one more application for the slicing knife. The length of the blade of a slicing knife of this KAI Pro. Why is that so important? Um, well, a slicing knife, let's say if you're doing a prime rib, which I will show you, a turkey breast, um, any type of slicing knife where you start with basically this knife goes down to a razor's edge and then comes up. I'm really not sure exactly what that is, but that's probably a sixteenth maybe. Um, so that gives you the weight, gives you the balance, but also gives you the precision of a razor's edge. So when you are slicing, basically you're not applying any pressure. You, you let the, the tool do the work, right? So you find your line, nice square 90 degree line, and basically back and forth, and that's for the length of the blade because you don't want to pull this blade out of your prime rib or the protein. You want to keep it connected inside at all times. So that way you don't have to start over, start over. Okay. Let's demonstrate that real quick. Okay, like I said before, we're talking about the length of this blade, and I'll just kind of demonstrate with you. Let's demonstrate with, I think I have a Victronox. I think this is the lightest um, out of the chef's knife or the utility knife, which is really nice for, you know, someone with smaller hands. Um, somebody in culinary school, you know, if you have a relative, a child, anybody aspiring to be a chef, um, and if you can't talk them out of it, uh, you know, get them a good knife and let them practice. And this is a great knife for that until they can kind of figure out what fits their hands, what fits their needs, how much they can work with the knife. Um, so let me just show you. With this knife, with, with this length blade, I basically have to work that blade a lot more. I have to work with it. I have to do more work than the, actually the blade is doing itself. With a slicer, like I said, with the way the contour of the blade, and if you just keep that, keep it at a 90 degree of perpendicular, let the blade do the work, that's for the length of it, okay? I don't have to, you know, bear down on it, really have to get involved in it. I just find my starting position for the thickness of the cut that I want to make, and then I just let the knife do the work. I don't direct it, don't follow it, just slice back and forth. So that's, that's the, uh, the purpose behind that slicing knife and out of this selection of knives today this is probably the one that has the fewest uses um, you know like I said the utility knife you can you can basically perform all these tasks with one knife this knife not so much okay because basically the shape of it the heel of it that's a big reason okay because if I came over here and try to do some 
some vegetable work with it. I have to work way over here so I can have the leverage. All right. I mean, I can do it, you know, but it's like wielding a sword. Very, you know, you don't want that going on in your kitchen or in your own personal kitchen at all. And so the heel, that's what, and I'm a lot closer to my work instead of very far removed. If that makes sense, slicing knife. Another type of slicer is a bread slicer. This is a Dexter. This is a great beginner knife, great knife to have at home. Um, something you don't have to spend a lot of money on because you're really not going to use this knife every day, I wouldn't think. Um, but this is, so you have a, an offset handle. I'll show you the, the differences and the reasons for that. All right, I'd like to touch on the slicers or the carving knives just one more time because really it's a, it's a specific use knife. Whereas we talked before, you know, the, the great knife to get started with uh, you know, to, to really hone your skills. And just an all-around knife, would, my choice would be an 8-inch chef's knife uh, with any of these fine brands, whether you choose, you know, Wustoff, Schoon, Victrinox. Who else do we have here today? Is that it? I believe so. Um, so really single purpose, a couple of different styles. I would call this more of a, you know, this is more of a carving knife um, for prime rib, turkey, anything you want to do at the table. Um, then we have, this is an offset, this is a Dexter, a uh, nice beginner knife, um, serrated edge, we'll show you the benefits of that real quick in just a second, I'll also show you the, the benefits of an offset handle. Um, this used to be serrated 10 years ago, um, take it to Knifeworks and let them hone that back for me. Uh, but basically I'm going to show you this with the, with the straight handle. Basically the difference in the, in the offset, I believe this is a little bit easier to use because I don't know if this knife will cut this bread and it won't. My fault, not Shun's fault. Haven't kept that thing sharp at all. See the benefit of the serrated, the serrated blade basically grabs and starts, grabs and starts. It actually kind of pulls it through and pushes it away from the bread. Very important that you do have a serrated knife. I think this one will cut it because it's so sharp. Uh, let's take a look. Yep, and it does. But basically, the difference in the offset handle and the straight handle, this puts me much further down from what I'm working on, takes me away from what I'm working on, but also I have to come all the way down to finish this cut. I have to come down level with my working surface, okay? If you're doing this, if you're doing this repetitively over and over and over again, like we do on a, a regular nightly basis here at the Greenbrier, always cutting bread, going out to tables, going out for appetizers, that sort of thing. Speaking of bread, burger buns. It's burger night here at the Greenbrier on Wednesday. So let me just show you real quick on this, on the offset blade. I've already cut through, okay? And my hand's not down here cramped on the cutting board. Okay, so it, it keeps me further, far enough away from what I'm working on to, to be precision, to keep this loaf in one stationary place instead of moving it around to finish my cut. Okay, so that's, that's just some things on the slicing knives. And from for all the knives that we looked at today, these are really single purpose, single purpose knife. This is, uh, you know, this could be dual purpose. I do use a boning knife for a lot of different things just because it's handy to keep it around. Um, I can put this in my apron. And then, you know, the go-to all around 8-inch chef's knife for, for basically all the work in the kitchen. You can do it with that. And then we have vegetable cleaver. Um, this is a much heavier blade, okay, a lot more rigid. And that's for doing that, just that tireless prep work that you have to come in and do over and over and over and over again. Okay, it's, it's going to hold, hold its edge a lot longer than something like this would, okay, because this is just more refined more precision cutting. This is more utilitarian. So with what we've done, let's uh, like to put together uh, some lunch for you guys. How's that sound? Aaron, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, pleasure. Anything else you want to add to the video today? Uh, you know, just maintenance. You know, choose a knife that, that fits you, that fits your style, fits your hand, fits your grip, what you want to do with it. Um, Take care of it, maintain it, learn how to sharpen it. It is the most important you know, tool in the kitchen by far in my opinion. 
Um, and then also, you know, come see us up here at Greenbrier. Absolutely. And folks. we're the only prime dry aged steakhouse in the area. You'll have to go to Nashville. Um, but everything's done in house from the bread, organic vegetables. We have a pastry chef here. You've seen them making the bread. Yes. Uh, we, we do it right, so call for a reservation up here at Greenbrier and come see me and ask me a question about a knife. Absolutely. Folks, be sure to join us here at the Greenbrier restaurant. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, ring that notification bell so you will know when we drop new videos. Join us down in the comments below. Ask Aaron a question. And be sure to hit that thumbs up button. Help out our algorithm on YouTube, folks. And don't forget, the big cuts, we carry it.